online and we are rolling. Hello, everyone. We are back again with the very generous um, Jerry Marzinski for giving us time again. Thank you so much for coming again. You're welcome. It's always fun to have you. I'm always stunned and, and I share so much of what you teach. So I appreciate you sharing it all with the world. I know it's probably keeping you very busy. It is. <laughs> you were telling me and tell everybody uh, if you want to uh, where you just got back from and, and the experience that you just had sounds really cool. Yeah, I just got invited to Romania for all expenses trip uh, there to uh, paid to speak to uh, a bunch of esoteric yogis, which was very interesting. Uh, they were very godly people. I mean, uh, much more so than I ever thought. Um, very, very generous, very, very caring. I, th I was taken care of better there than I am at home. <laughs> <laughs> so well, it was an interesting. Awesome. It was an interesting experience. I, I uh, spoke in front of 500 people or so. Wow! Uh, and, and did a number of videos. So, do you notice the difference between a prison and there? In the vibe, <laughs> <laughs> shoot, yeah, there's a massive difference. Yeah, yeah, it's it's amazing what um, programming will do to a child and how people can get so far behind. And we have a lot to chat about when it comes to prisons. If you if you don't mind, just give anyone that has not been here before and heard you, just give them a little background about um, you and what you what you do and who you are and all that good stuff. Oh, well, I, let me see where to start there. Um, I worked for seven years in the biggest state hospital on the planet. There were like uh, 10,000 people there when I got there. Uh, the whole time I was I was studying the schizophrenic voices. You know, what are they? Now, the psychiatric mafia says they're hallucinations. I found that that was totally wrong. They run very specific, repeatable, predictable patterns. Uh and we just found a couple of guests, one who recorded them and another one who could see them. Mm -hmm. So I, I got them on my website at jerrymarzinski.com for anybody who's interested in that. But uh, with the psychiatric mafia and big farmer telling you about the voices being hallucinations, it's dead wrong. Mm -hmm. These things are entities. They're negative parasitic entities. And they run the same patterns and they're the same all over the planet. So. They're, they're running the same patterns at the uh, big state hospital in Georgia that I used to work at as they did here in Arizona. And now that I'm working with people all over the world, it's the same patterns with people all over the, all over the planet. Right. You know, so right. If they're running patterns, they can't be hallucinations. Right. So, and so there after, were nothing good. I remember you saying there was nothing, there was never a positive hallucination. They were always negative. Right. Right. They're, they're always negative. They're anti-religious. You know, they, they hate the 23rd Psalm. Um, you know, uh, patients told me that when they repeat the 23rd Psalm, those voices react like worms thrown on a hot frying pan. So why would a hallucination do that? You know, why would a hallucination always be constantly negative? And why it's supposed to be random. A hallucination is supposed to be all over the place, positive, negative, everywhere in between. These aren't. These are consistently negative and they're very nasty, you know, mm -hmm. very, very vulgar. Mm -hmm. uh, and that they don't like anybody or anything. And it sounds like they don't even like themselves very much. You know, but they are entities and you can speak to them. And I have. And they can carry on a coherent conversation. And anybody who is around schizophrenics or works with them, you can see some time where they lapse into a conversation with these things. Mm -hmm. And it's like one side of a, a telephone conversation where you can hear what they're saying, but you can't hear what the, the voice or the entity is saying. Yeah. Do they ever translate for you? Well, yeah. Yeah. Matter of fact, in the prison, I had groups of prisoners who worked with me who agreed to tell me in real time everything that the voices were saying. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and they were always in English. Uh, you know, I've heard of voices appearing in another language, but that defeats their purpose. You know, right. if the person can't understand them, then they can't do what they're sent there to do, which is so basically I never knew that one. That's interesting. 
Yeah, it is basically to destroy them. Absolutely. And so you you also worked in prisons as well. You worked in the the mental institutions, but you also worked in prisons. And that's what fascinated me. And we talked about how we would touch base on that um, this time. And so yeah. um, how many years did you work in prisons? Well, I worked for 18 years in, in prisons. Uh, and that's where I had the group of inmates that would tell me in real time what the voices were telling them. Oh, okay. So uh, I was thinking I, I got, it would be at the insane asylum. So I'm surprised at that. No, no. It, what happened was the psychiatrists, uh, they were very nervous when they found out I was asking the, the uh, schizophrenics what their voices were saying. I got called into two of their offices and ordered to stop asking them questions because it, 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 the voices don't like being asked about. You know, they they don't want somebody digging into their business. So they upset the person. And uh, when the psychiatrist found out I was doing that, I got called up on the red carpet and they ordered to stop. And the psychiatrist went, you know, they are hallucinations. What you're doing is reinforcing them by asking the patients about them, you know, and you're not ignoring them. Uh, no, I didn't ignore them because they <laughs> they're the root. They're the cause of schizophrenia. It's not sure. some psychiatric uh, mind brain disorder chemical imbalance crap that that Eli Lilly made up in the what sixties when they came out with Prozac. Mm -hmm. It's a complete lie. They knew it was a lie at the time. Yeah, you know, and, and they stuck with it. And, oh, and still are big, big. You know, the psychiatric mafia are only drug dispensers for big pharma. Sure, absolutely. You know? One of the things I love on your, um, I wrote it down on your website it's the first thing that you see is that quote and it says when an honest man discovers he's mistaken he will either cease to be mistaken or cease to be honest yeah that was uh sherry put that up i, went, I love well, it yeah the, the, you leave it there <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah. It so defines what you it. did. It defines what you did. You came out and you told the truth once you realized that you were, and you weren't really mistaken. You were just um, groomed, basically, you know, to to only, you're only allowed to see this much. We won't let you see the rest. Well, they don't, they don't see it themselves. You know, so the, uh, the, uh, who was it? Uh, Carnegie and the Rockefellers took over the medical system back in, what was it, 1930, I think it was, with the uh, um, Flexner, Flexner report. So basically, they paid off Congress to make a law that medical schools could only graduate doctors who took a pharmacological uh, curriculum. You know, so everybody else was, um, what do they call them? Uh, like uh, the naturopaths. Yeah, they 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 assume they they treated them like a bunch of goofballs. Mm -hmm. You know, they they don't know what they're doing. We're the only ones that know what we're doing. Uh, so they went with that, and that's where big pharma stepped in, and they that, then they took control of the universities. Right. You know, so they're they're putting out, you know, thousands of psychiatrists brainwashed to believe that the voices are hallucinations, and they're still doing it. Hundred percent. A hundred percent. And so when you started talking about prison, that's when I got interested because I have, um, I was part of a group that started a charity to help um, people out of youth prison. And so I got to see firsthand um, the mess that is a prison, but also how people are in jail when really they should be getting help for their mental health. Um, what percentage or do you, I mean, do you want to, do you have some stats that you could just throw out or do you want me to just say, okay, Jerry, what would you guess? Like what percentage of the people do you think are, are there because they're actual true criminals? And then what percentage do you think actually have some spectrum of, of mental health issues? Well, if you look at what the psychiatric mafia did, they got a, they got a diagnosis for virtually everything. That's true. You know, the two two kids that are fighting with each other is uh, what it, they got some diagnosis for that. You know, if, uh, if a wife loses her husband and is depressed for more than two months, she's got major depression. I mean, they so they got they cover everything. But the serious seriously mentally ill, uh, 
there's a lot of them in there. What what happened there is, uh, I think it was back in the 70s, maybe late 70s, early 80s, the, the, the bizarre state of California was charging their people so much, so much taxes, the taxes were so heavy that there was a tax revolt. And they, they, the people came up with something called Proposition 19 and demanded that their property taxes be lowered. All right. So uh, Arizona made up this bull crap and went, oh, well, uh, it's, uh, well, Arizona went with it, but California went, well, we'll just uh, release all these mentally ill from the state hospitals and put them in with a more normal population. You know, that'll be good for them. No. That, well, most of these people couldn't work, you know, so what are they going to do? They're going to steal. They're going to sell drugs. They're going to do drugs. Uh, they, they weren't capable of, of, uh, of working, you know, so they emptied out and then it caught on across the country. It spread all across the country. So here they are trying to save money by, by throwing these guys out on the street. So the crime, you know, the, the crime, astronomically grew and they wouldn't take their medicines even when they were in the state hospitals you know these these guys were so out of it thinking that these these chronically mentally ill are going to go out of their way to take those medicines they hated those medicines you know they the psychiatrists keep their their hands on them so they have to prescribe them they want control of those medicines those medicines aren't abusable you know, the, the, nobody in their right mind would take those. Even people in their crazy mind won't take them. The, the side effects are so awful. <laughs> people no, in their nobody crazy wants mind to take, take them. <laughs> you know. But the, these psychiatrists are holding on. I mean, they got a death grip on the prescription for those things. Sure. Um, and, and they're making, uh, oh, God, what was it, $34 billion a year, I think it was. On, on the sale of antipsychotic drugs. These are some of the most dangerous drugs that are prescribed by the medical profession. They rot out the person's brain with long-term use. Yeah, it's so sad. So, so uh, you know, what happened is all these, all these guys ended up in prison. Right. You know, for, you know, doing crazy stuff on the street or attacking people or selling drugs or, or using Suicide drugs. Suicide even, right? Yeah, suicide. Uh, or a assault. suicide attempt, yeah. Yeah, assaults. All they, they don't send you to prison for suicide attempts, although it's illegal. That's interesting. Right. You know, so it's like, but it's not illegal to be crazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they have to do something to get in there. And uh, some of them do it on purpose. They get out and they go commit a crime so they can get back in because they can't survive on their own. Yeah. Yeah, no, I heard about that from the guys that I worked with. They're young kids and they were scared when they got out because a lot of them went to jail when they were, you know, 14, 15, 16. And then they came out as 18, 19 and they had to go get jobs and they had to go do things and they had no skills at all. They didn't know where. And so some of them were like, well, I would rather just be in jail. Like they would literally say that. <laughs> like, yeah. like it's a, it's a choice. I can, I can choose to be taken care of at the state and then just sit and be in this, this harbor myself in the jail for the rest of your life. And so you really, you're starting with like the bottom of like the barrel and, but going back to what you were talking about. So there were a point, there was a point in time where there were a lot of insane asyl asylums and then they all closed around the same decade, right? Yeah. Yep. With Proposition 13, they closed and they dumped all those people out on the street. Right. So that I, most of them, uh, most, a lot of them ended up in prison. So right. the prison population, uh, it went from, we, we've already got the U.S., uh, as I was telling you earlier, the U.S. incarcerates more people per uh Oh, capita, the friggin' mosquito. Uh, <laughs> Get him. Talk about a parasite. You wouldn't believe there. The, you wouldn't <laughs> believe there'd be so many mosquitoes in in Arizona. Right, it's kind of dry there's there. There's a lot. Yeah. Well, you know, Bill Gates has been making them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's making them, and they're. He might have sent some with... to you. You're 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 being too. <laughs> yeah, he's you're he's too sitting in Florida. From what I hear, he's hurt in Florida. Florida and Texas. And so, yeah, during even during Reagan's time, um, it, it doubled the amount of people that were in jail. 
which I thought was amazing because it was like something like 300,000, 365,000, I forget. And then by the time he was, you know, leaving, it was close to a million. And now do you know how many people are incarcerated in America? Oh, golly, no. You know, I probably should have looked that stuff up ahead of time. Yeah, but no. It, I, I tell you, they, like I said, they incarcerate more people per capita than any other country in the world. Right. You know, that's that's not a good statistic for people. No, yeah. it's horrible. I've heard so many crazy stories too. Um, I, I I've heard of people who were invited to dinner parties to talk about uh, investing in prisons, private prisons, and you know, I mean, think about that. They're literally trying to use rappers to glorify drugs and crimes so that they can fill up their prisons. Yeah. It's, it's you nuts. Know, and, and what they do is they go to the legislatures and, the, and they say, uh, you know, on top of a nice healthy bonus, we can give you, we can, we can uh, incarcerate these people for much less than the state does. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's and still they do, but, but they don't offer any rehabilitation whatsoever. It's just a human holding tank. They run it as cheaply as they can. There's no programs. That there's no nothing from the ones I saw. So what were you doing then? Um, just handling, like putting out fires? Well, with the private prison, I knew uh, one of the wardens there. Mm -hmm. So he was a progressive warden, and he wanted to set up some of the programs I'd developed. Oh, okay. Uh, but they, they wouldn't even fund the minimum for the material that he needed right you know to, to get the thing running so those private prisons are they're bull crap you know they it, it's all about money 100 you know, at least at, at least the state and federal prisons have some rehabilitation i mean mm -hmm. in the state prisons from what i saw it's gone way down especially here in arizona when i started off uh at the beginning of my 18 year stint there uh they they had auto mechanics they had uh um Gardens where the inmates went out in gardens. They had work crews to go work on the roads. Um, they had different skills. They had, uh, uh, you know, community college involved there. And then as time went on and the population just kept increasing and increasing and increasing. So they had to double bunk these guys and they put two guys in room designed for one. Um, then they had big dormitory rooms that, that they used. Uh, but the, the um, rehabilitation aspect just kept going down, 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 and down, you know, until these people were, they had nothing to do, you know, so they got into fights with one another. And, uh, you know, so trying to get them some rehabilitation there, my wife's a computer programmer, so it took us several years to develop a computer program, a computer-assisted program uh, that would administer uh, different programs, um, alcohol education, drug education, parenting, uh, um, the, the, all those different kind of programs. Sure. So we, we came up with booklets uh, that the prisoners could take back to their room. And we started administering them and they, they cheated on everything, <laughs> everything. They had all these ingenious ways to cheat. They'd write the answers on their hands. They'd uh, do hand signals with one another. They, They'd uh, put the answers inside of a clear pen. Uh, you know, the cheating was just incredible. And to keep up with that was a real pain in the butt. Right. So, uh, and, and also the grading of the test was a pain in the butt, took a lot of time. Yeah. So uh, what, I, what, what I did is I started developing a computer program that where we give them the booklets to take back to their cells. Mm -hmm. and study in their cells. So they have something productive to do. So the cell is really their classroom. Right. Then they come back once a week and it took, it took years to develop the software for this. But what the, what the computer would do is we had to have it administer the questions randomly. Mm -hmm. Otherwise they'd figure out what the code they, was. They'd figure <laughs> out what it was. And then we had to have the computer also randomly mix up the questions. So they couldn't cheat. And then we had to come up with an encrypted password that they couldn't break in because some of them were computer savvy. Oh, my gosh. And, and, and this took like three years. I mean, it was just uh, step by step. Finally, we had it. 
you know, so we have a, a room of like eight computers or seven computers. And we had an inmate clerk who would collect the books. So when, when they were done taking a test over one section, they would turn in their booklet and they'd be given the next one. Right. You know, so then they could come back next week and just take the test on the computer. Right. But what they, the, the counselor who, the prison counselor had to do would to be start up all the computers and be in the room when they were being run. Right. They were too sorry to do that. <laughs> they turned over the encrypted password to the inmate. Uh, oh, my gosh. Uh, the, the inmate trustee. And he, he broke in and he turned it into a store. So we were, you know, this was probably the best program that the, the Arizona prison system ever had. Mm -hmm. It was the cheapest. It was the most efficient. It was the most effective. It was measurable. And they couldn't and even took, have somebody oversee it properly. They couldn't even have somebody oversee it. So, so and I found out. Go ahead. Go ahead. Out. I was going to yeah, so, so say I found out that, that wasn't the only case in, in our prison. You know, so in our prison, I would go to the warden. I said, look, at look what the, you got. You, you can't have this happen. You're turning a program that has a very high volume and is being run legitimately when run legitimately is doing a lot of good. Sure. But you you allow the these inmates to take control of it. Then it, it becomes it's, it's reinforcing criminal behavior at, mm -hmm. at a, 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 a intense level, at a large level. Mm -hmm. So. You know, these wardens, uh, they, they stopped it and they didn't like it, you know, but they stopped it. But then I found out the other prisons and others in other places in the state where I set these things up. The counselors were doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, they turned it over to an inmate trustee and the inmate trustee was selling the answers for a store, you know, candy, cigarettes, whatever you could get from the, the other inmates. Yeah, I'll give you the answer. You owe me two packs of cigarettes or something right. like that. So it was just this criminal it was power. Uh, yeah. Wow. So I went to the, uh, when I found out that this was happening in other places, I said, uh, I went to the Phoenix where the head of the uh, programs, substance abuse programs for the state prison was there. And I said, this is what's happening. And it's happening in all these prisons. I've seen it with my own eyes. You need to stop this. You know, you're, you're, you're turning one of the best programs you've ever had, the most productive, the most measurable, the cheapest, the most efficient, and, and allowing them to turn it into a criminal enterprise. And she looks at me and she goes, uh, no, you don't tell us what to do. We tell you what to do. Oh, lovely. And, and I looked at her and I said, not in this case, lady. The software is copyrighted in my wife's name. You're using it by her good graces. You either mm -hmm. run these things right or you shut them down. Right. You know what she did? She shut down $10,000 worth of computers. Just shut them down. Wow. That's the kind of people you have to deal with in these places. Yeah. Well, and not so all that, of them are like that. Yeah. But that goes back to one of the most shocking things that I learned from working with these young men. I mean, they were in the highest security Texas prison for youth. They could get Burger King. They could get porn. They could have sex. They could do all kinds of things. Why? Because of the guards. And I just was stunned when I found that out. I mean, this is a youth prison. Like, they shouldn't be doing any of those things yeah. in, at all. You know, I mean, they shouldn't be allowed in a regular prison either. And so, so then it comes back to, I really wanted to ask you this first. What is it about having power over another person like that? that starts perverting and twisting the minds of the people who are actually the ones who are supposed to be responsible and, you know, making sure the rules are there, but not being shady or abusive. What makes people go abusive in those positions? It happens all the time. Well, for one, they kind of uh, recruit those kind of people. Oh, you know, that makes I, sense. I remember one recruiting sign for Arizona was, you know, um, th th this could be you. And here, there, here's a woman standing there with a shotgun over all these all these men. You know, it appeals to a certain kind of people. Got it. You know, we can give you the power kind of thing. And, uh, you know, not all of them. Are, there were a lot of good people in there. But, oh, yeah. I'm not saying all of them. But no, 
no, but, 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 but there it were, was there were some... very accessible. Yeah. And, and, uh, there's, there's one, uh, one fellow who's a, he was a professor at the university of Arizona. He wrote crossing the yard and it told of his experiences while he worked as a volunteer at the prison. He watched guards haul in cocaine, smuggle stuff up, uh, you know, there's a lot of money. So there's a constant uh, a constant conflict between the, uh, the, the rules and, and the inmate population. And the inmate population is always trying to take over the running of the prison. So like in your case, you know, they got the porn, they got the McDonald's, they got the, the, this mm-hmm. kind of stuff. And it takes a staunch warden and, and a lot of good staff to stop that kind of stuff from happening. I mean, you have to have people with some integrity. And uh, a lot of the people I saw were lazy. They, they, they were just, you know, a lot of the, they, they could do virtually nothing and get away with it. Right. Um, and, and then, you know, there was this, kind of tyrannical uh, within the administration. I had much more trouble with the administration than I did with the, with the prisoners by a long shot, you know, and uh, it's like a, a tyrannical uh, administration. It will do it this way. And they, they don't realize the, the consequences of, of what they're doing a lot of the times. Um, it's like they're power hungry. Well, they have to have a certain amount of power to control the prison. Mm, of course. You know, and and there are prisons that are active. They're taken over by the inmates. Oh. You know, so so they, they get it. the guards, you know, well, you, you know, uh, we'll behave ourselves and especially the gangsters. I mean, so there's constant, constant tension between uh, the staffs, you know, as they try to, to run those things. I remember... Um, you know, one one case I was working a um, wasn't quite a maximum security prison, but was a, like a heavy medium security prison. Mm-hmm. So here's you know three three tiers of uh, or two tiers of, of cells, and my psychology office was right next to one of these uh, one of these cell blocks. Right. And I, I was watching what happened. Uh, you know, it was like they had this little small guy who was a black belt in karate. <laughs> and he was an arrogant little SOB. <laughs> and and he, he would treat the inmates like crap. And then what he did is he'd bring over his his fellow hard butts, you know, like, oh, hey, come work with me. I mean, we're, we're controlling this, uh, this. this We got control of this, this cell block kind of thing. And what he would do is they'd, they'd stir him up all day. Man. You know, they, they, they'd challenge him. I get this guy looked like to me, like he really wanted to get in a fight with one, you know, the, uh, and there's serious repercussions if you strike a guard. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, he's kind of egging them on, you know, not only will you get in trouble, but, uh, you know, I'll kick your butt. Maybe <laughs> you never know. Right. And, and, uh, so he's here, he is stirring these guys up all day. And then he brings in the other hard butt staff and they're stirring them up all day. And then at night, these these two really mellow guys came on who had a good sense of humor, and they were like jokes or jokers. You know, they would joke with the yeah, way more and, fun, and way more fun, and you know, kind of uh, they, they were much more human and 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 funny, and and they kind of break up all the tension from the day. So here's here's this entire building that was like breathing. I mean, all day the tension was built and then at night these guys would come in and it would, they would release it. So it was like going back and forth, back and forth. But these, these hard butts during the day were not doing any of the paperwork they should have done. You know, so uh, the guys at night are saying, Hey, we can't get our regular work done and have to do all the paperwork from the time also. So they got a female guard who was working two jobs and had kids and uh, she kept falling asleep in the control room. And then when they wake her up, she denied that she'd been asleep. You know, oh, no, I wasn't sleeping. Oh, yeah, kind of. and, uh, <laughs> Sounds so like did, Jeffrey Epstein's <laughs> um, jail. <laughs> <laughs> so what they did one night is they wrapped her in toilet paper in the control room. So, so here's like, you know, a couple hundred inmates could see this happening in the control room. They thought it was funny. You know, so here she is. She's, a, she's asleep in this chair wrapped in toilet paper. She can't deny it now. Yeah, that's what they're figuring. 
And uh, one of the lieutenants walks in at night and he sees this and he went psychotic on him. You know, he broke him up. He, he didn't let him work together ever again mm -hmm. and uh, uh, shipped them to different different units. And I'm watching this hard guy come in every night, every night and, or every day and, and just whip these guys up and there's no release at night. Right. You know, so I went to the captain of the unit and I, I said, uh, Captain, you know, you, you can't take these guys out of there. You don't understand what's going on there. If you take them out, there's, th this place is going to blow apart. Hey, get out of here, psych. You're just an inmate lover kind of thing, you know. And I'm like, Wait, Wait. <laughs> you know, Captain. They called you, you don't psych? Under, you, you don't under, <laughs> yeah, they call me psych. In, in, inmate lover. The psychs, the, the psychs were inmate you, lovers. You inmate lover. <laughs> and I said, you know, Captain. Listen, <laughs> you're, it's not going to be good if you take those guys out of there. You know, this is what happens at, at, at night, you know, during the daytime. This, this little hard guy whips them all up. These guys were breaking it up. Yeah, I get out of here, you know. So, uh, okay, I, I did my best. Two weeks later, that place exploded. And uh, you what, what happened? Him. I warned him. And what had happened was one inmate stole an orange out of the uh, out of the kitchen, yeah. and one of these hard ass guards confronted him and said, "Hey, you stole that orange. Give it to me." You know. Now the, the mistake he made is there was a number of cells open on the bottom floor, okay. and the inmate took the orange and it th he threw it, it at it. him. <laughs> oh, gosh. Know? And and then. Then the uh, guard went to get get at the inmate, and and they began to fight. And then all these other ones came out, and they were rip roaring mad anyway. So that guy barely escaped with his life. And then they they started attacking the control room. Now that bulletproof glass will stop a bullet, but it won't stop a brick. Oh, you know, it'll, it'll, so they broke into the control room. They took over the control room. They almost had a guard. They had him by the leg. They were pulling him back. He just barely got out. That's like then a movie. Yeah, it's like a movie. Then they destroyed everything in that place that could be destroyed. The the uh, sexual offenders. See, when they smashed the control panel, so they got into the control room. They smashed the control panel, broke everything in there. They burnt everything that would burn. You know, they they threw mattresses out on the floor. It, it was a mess. It, it was they they smashed out everything. They threw the the washing machines off the tiers. They it was just like a, a hurricane that hit the place. It's like war. And then, they, then then they were trying to get at the sex offenders so they could they could kill. Them. They wanted to kill them. You know, so they were throwing lit paper under their doors, uh, trying to you know trying to burn them out. Dang. Um, and it, it it was a million dollars worth of damage. I'd got out of there 45 minutes before that happened. Wow. Um, and then I watched the newspapers, what they said in the newspapers. They went, was inmates it... were, they, they said inmates went crazy over an orange. That was yeah. the story that came out in the press. Yeah. Um, and, and none of the staff were allowed to say the truth to anybody. You know, if they found you told the, the, the newspapers what really happened, They'd fire you. Right. Oh, my gosh. It's just so crazy to me because that's what that's part of the problem with the whole the way it all began is that they were having the same problem in the mental institutions. So they the guards were like abusing these people and it ended up being a huge problem. And that was one of the main reasons, at least that they used to cite that that's why they they shut them down. There was just nothing no, good no, coming no. out of it. No, they shut them. Well, there's nothing good coming out of it because all they did was drugging these people. Oh, well, that's so. So true these too. these psychotropic drugs were discovered by the Germans, uh, uh, and then refined by the French. What if they were testing them, you know, testing the well, drugs. Well, they on they, them? Te they tested them over here. So back back then, when they came out, uh, I, I don't know where it was. It was like in the. I mean, the Germans were using them in World War II. The Nazis were using them, so they came out before the, probably in the, in the early '40s or late '30s, and uh, they were discovered in a dye lab, in uh, in Germany. Oh. So these the, these dyes that they were using to dye clothes. I mean, the the workers were getting all zonked out, and uh, the, the French took that and they synthesized it into a drug. 
wow. and they would use it as a painkiller for operations and that kind of stuff. And uh, then somebody got the great idea that hey, this would, let's see what this will do with a, a you know a crazy population. But the Freudians controlled things at that time. They wouldn't let them use it in in the Europeans uh, in the European hospital. So they brought it over to the United States. Now, at this time, there was a battle going on between the psychiatrist and the neurologist for who's going to have the dominant position in this field. Wow, and the I never knew that. Yeah, the psychiatrists were using losing badly because nothing they did was working. You know, at least the neurologist, you know, they, they were had doing some kind of good. But the psychiatrists were like the stepchilds. You know, their their Freudian stuff was too expensive. It 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 didn't work well. Uh, boy, I got the sun coming in on my face here. I know. It's interesting. You, you look like part of you is disappearing, like one of the, <laughs> the entities a, that you talk about. Come, Only it looks like a nice entity, not a bad one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the sun is setting out here now. Yeah. So um, what the psychiatrists, when they the psychiatrists saw that they could drug up an entire population and, and sedate them, they latched onto those drugs and that was their, that was their safety. That was their power. That was their powers was those drugs. And even today, they don't like regular general practitioners using those things. Right. You know, they got them convinced that they're the only specialists to know how to use these things. And in reality, it's not even hard science. No, no. You know, they got everybody convinced that, uh, uh, you know, psychosis is a, a biochemical imbalance. Yeah. Has anybody ever seen these guys give any lab tests to a patient to see what's out of balance or by how much? Right. You know, there's like, what, 23 neurotransmitters or something like that in the brain? You know, you'd think if there's a biochemical imbalance in the brain causing these mental illnesses, you'd... that there should be some kind of test they give them to find out what the baseline is. So you know, where are you at it. now? You know? Yeah. No, they don't exist. This is all made up by the psychiatric mafia and big pharma. This this biochemical imbalance thing. This and, is why I love you, Jerry. You t you speak the truth. <laughs> yeah. And they're still pushing it. I mean, I pulled up an advertisement not too long ago. I got it in a stack of papers here somewhere where they they're advertising. See, what they did is changed it. Though they instead of saying it is, they're saying it is believed or experts believe yeah, yeah, that. Yeah. You know this this bull crap. You know, to, to lead people on. Yeah. yeah. Well, almost every medical study I read has some wording that if you really, really look at it, it looks like it says suggest this, or there's always that one word that I'm just kind of like, it's, it's legalism, you know, it's just wild. I just put, put this up because this um, lovely lady, Courtney Walsh said, great topic. Enjoy Jerry's perspective. If you think about it, um, we are all in mental cages of one sort or, of an or another. Jerry's wisdom is very valuable and um, you're a great interviewer. She had also asked earlier, where is it? She had asked a question. Where did it go? Oh, I guess about the mental cages. Um, and so uh, how would you compare somebody who is a criminal to somebody who has some sort of mental imbalance um, and, and where you would put them? Like, how would you, how would you do it? Um, because obviously this isn't working. No, no, the, the drugs aren't working. They, uh, they, you know, they have their place with, with, with psychotic, uh, psychotic, schizophrenics that are uncontrollable. Right. You know, that they're past the point where they they want any help. So these voices that they hear sound just like, you know, the voices you hear in your head right now. Mm -hmm. Only they, they say different things. Right. They sound like, like the thousands of other thoughts you have going through your head. So, you know, the prisoners, uh, a, a lot of them believe that those voices are who they are. You know, because we're taught as kids, you know, from the time you... Uh, your kid it's like every every thought you have going through your head belongs to you that's far from true you know uh, Emmanuel Swedenborg the Christian mystic says none of your thoughts belong to you you're the, you're the chooser you choose which ones you want to pay attention to and uh, you know do you agree with that 
Yeah. Yeah, me too. Yeah. So at some level, you know, especially the negative thoughts. I mean, you can, it, there's, there's not one person in, in the, that prison who hasn't done what normal people have thought about doing. <laughs> the only difference is they acted on it. Sure. You know, so what they are is they're like the subconscious of society. You know, everybody has those negative thoughts. They don't like them. They're, they're afraid of them. But these guys actually acted on them and they get thrown away. They, and, and, you know, you, you don't see anybody going in there. They won't let me in. You know, if a, if a legislator came through there, he was surrounded by a crowd of wardens, administrators. They wouldn't let him talk to the prisoners. Um, and any prisoner who talked to them and said anything wrong would there be hell to pay. Sure. You know, so it's a sealed off society where nobody can really see what's going on in there except the people who work there. And they're Which not allowed so to talk about it. It's so dangerous when you think about it. It's so dangerous. And so in your, in just your opinion, I'm not looking for stats. We're not holding you to this, but in the in the in the prison that you worked in, what percentage of those guys that were there were actually mentally way far off that shouldn't have been in a prison? Well, that shouldn't have been in a prison. Yeah, like well, they should well, have they're, been they're, getting mental health help well, somewhere they, else. You, or... you look, you you look at what the mental health system is in the United States. It's the psychiatric mafia drugging people. You know, and and the, these regular therapies that they have, you know, that they're teaching in school, they don't work. You know, I've, I've had, uh, what are the eight years, four years of undergraduate and four years of graduate school, and they're teaching these therapies. They don't work. <laughs> you know, now, some of these new energetic therapies that are coming out, like the, the MACE energy method that uh, I trained in uh, under there, it works. I mean, these these psychological problems are gone. You know, and they're gone in like an hour. You know, it actually works. They don't want that. So the people who came up with the, the Mace Energy Method took it to, um, uh, where did they take it first? They took it to the universities and they showed them. They demonstrated on, on the staff there. Look, it works. Here, we'll show you. We'll give you some sessions. We'll show. They said, you give us the patent, we'll we'll consider it. Wow. So they said, first you know, screw you, we're not going to give you the patent. You probably will bury it anyway. So they went up to the legislature and then they showed the legislature, hey, we should be using this in the prisons and social service areas. They blew it off. You know, it, and you look at, I, I, to answer your question, that I'd say probably 20 to 25 percent of the prison population are, are seriously mentally ill. You know, that's like a bipolar. Uh, some form of schizophrenia, or 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 some other, you know, serious mentally ill case. Uh, and, but the, the the rest of them run the gamut. I mean, they're they're, um, uh, and there's a number of them that could could be helped by these therapies, uh, even if they had some trained th therapist in in the prison. You know, right. and what what I found is that. They went from kind of when I started off, letting us kind of do what we felt needed to be done to as the as the population increased, they wanted to cover their butts with more and more paperwork, you know, to make it look like, oh, yeah, we're doing something here. <laughs> you know? so, so here's all these forms, all these records, all these kind of things. Um, you know, there was here was another case where uh, I had one one really psychotic prisoner on, on this unit. And uh, he wasn't medicated. So what they would do, they'd, they'd drug the ones who were causing problems. And the ones who weren't causing problems but were just crazy, they would leave them be. Wow. So they didn't want to pay. The, the, those drugs are expensive. Mm -hmm. You know, they're really expensive. And uh, I, I think it would take probably seven eight $800 a month to, to keep somebody uh, sure. Saying here in the United States on Risperdal or one of the major antipsychotics. Sure. You know? And you can only get them by prescription from the psychiatric mafia. So you have to pay for an office visit from those bozos. And then you have to go and go to the pharmacy, pay the pharmacist, 
and then buy this seven eight hundred dollar medicine. You can go across the border. It's at sixty miles south of here, across the border in New Mexico, you can get those same drugs mm -hmm. that cost seven eight hundred dollars here in the U.S. over the counter in Mexico for seventy five dollars. If you need to see a psychiatrist, you can go see him, and he'll go. Well, I think you ought to try this one to start with. He'll prescribe it, you know. And uh, you go in there and you get it. If it works, you don't ever have to go see him again. You just go to the pharmacy and you get that stuff. It's not abusable medicine. Nobody wants it. It's awful. <laughs> it has awful side effects. Yeah. That's why nobody stays on it. And so that's you know? why it kind of knocks out the ones that are starting trouble. And so so they they basically put them in like a, a chemical straitjacket then. Well, that's what a, that's what these uh, you know, psych psychiatric medications are. They're chemical straitjackets. So instead of, you know, when I got into Central State Hospital, the, the those drugs were already there, but there were attendants there that still remembered when they had to fight these these violent patients. And and schizophrenic patients are su supernaturally strong. You know, they they're amazing. The they, entities uh, are strong. Yeah. Yeah, they get that strength from somewhere that's not human strength, you know. So they would only drug the ones that were causing problems. And then they got then they got to the point this this uh, one supervisor we had, he he was uh he, he was brown nose in the administration and uh and one of the psychiatrists. So what he would do is he he'd have he'd have us do the work for the psychiatrist, spot the guys that were causing a lot of trouble. And then refer them to the psychiatrist. You know, so the psychiatrist had another job, and he would come and just see whoever he had to see. You know, kind of. So they worked something out between them, some kind of deal. And uh, then, then the psychiatrist was under fire for using uh, too much psychiatric medication. Right. One of them got in trouble for it, and they threatened to fire him because he was he was practicing psychiatry as he always had. And they gave him a very low rating and, uh, you know, just really dirtied up his uh, his record saying, you you know, you're giving out way too many drugs. I mean, these are non-medical people, you know, the administration saying that. So he's like, I'm like, I can't believe what he showed me what they wrote him. It was Is like, it the private prison just not wanting to pay for it? Well, this was a state prison. This was a state prison and the private prison is going to be even worse. So. Uh, what what this our psychology supervisor at the time did is he sent a stooge up to the medical unit. So so the rest of us people working psych would send psychotic patients who were out of control to the medical unit. They'd be evaluated by the psychiatrist there, put on drugs, and then sent back. Okay, and then from then on they would get their drugs in the unit. So what this guy did, he's despicable. Uh, he, he's working his way up the line, you know, he wants to advance. And so he's, he's brown those and, and he, he needs to cut back on the meds because, you know, the psychiatrist is being blamed for using too much medicine. And we're the ones referring the, these crazy people and uh, to, to the psychiatrist, sure. to the medical unit. So he gets a stooge and he puts the, puts his psychologist in there and his job is to re-diagnose everybody that we sent in there and send them back to the unit. And say, oh, they're just fine. They're just fine, you know. So there was this one guy in the unit I was in, you know, I was keeping track of his voices, and they were getting more and more violent. This guy was losing more and more control. So I sent him over to the medical unit, said, these are the symptoms. He's, he's, he's threatening this other inmate. Um, he's, he's getting increasingly upset and violent. I need, he, he needs to be, he needs to be drugged. You need to do something or he's going to hurt somebody. So the stooge turns him back and said, oh no, he's just a personality, any social personality disorder. So I put another thing in there, you know, a full page. These are the symptoms. These are all the bad things that uh, th this guy's going to hurt somebody. He's, you know, this is what he's doing. That's building up. He's losing more and more control. I sent him back again. The stooge sends him back again, saying it's a uh, uh, antisocial personality disorder. So I send him back a third time with two pages worth of information. Okay, send him that. They send him back again. Two weeks later, he stabbed another inmate thirteen times, and I was so mad 
that I could not go to work that day because I was afraid I'd beat the shit out of the uh, the chief psychologist. (laughs) I I, I, I That would be quite a headline. Yeah, I would have been fired. I mean, but I I didn't trust myself not to be able to walk into his office. He's so mad. Knock knock the crap out of him. Boy, I would have loved to do that. Well, and I was thinking about that too. Um, Do they actually put, so they know who, who, is the 25%, let's say that there's a fourth of these guys that are very dangerous and unpredictable and or drugged out and then they're fine. Do they let them go with the regular population or do they kind of keep them together? You know what I'm saying? Well, they pretty much keep them together. They, you know, they have, a, um, I think they, they have certain units where the most dangerous are going or isolated. But yeah, they're they're in with the regular population, you know. So, um, so like somebody's kid does something wrong, ends up in jail for a little bit. They could have a roommate that's literally psychotic. psychotic. Yeah, there was one time where I was uh, I was the psych for the jail for the prison. Okay, and uh, that's where the worst of the worst from the entire prison went, and. Uh, I got a, I, I walked into my office one day and and here was a uh, a note from one of the prisoners saying uh they you know they my roommate's crazy you know he's 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 pacing his cell all night he's, he's talking to himself he's uh he's out of it you know he's he's uh he's scary yeah I caught him standing over me at three in the morning staring down at me and I don't know what he was thinking that'd be so, so scary. he said I, I can't deal with this so um at that same time, I got a, 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 a call from the captain of the unit saying, you got to come over here and do something with this, you know, this crazy guy, this, this, this cell that we have these people into, it's not working out real well. So I, I look up uh, the sane fella in that cell and, and see what he's in there for. He was in there for snitching off the, um, the, uh, what is it? The Aryan brotherhood which is a Uh, gang you know it's a nasty gang in the prison he snitched off one of their drug deals mm. and they stabbed him and he was in there for um protective custody so so he's totally sane you know trying to do a good thing and uh, they wanted him dead they wanted him so dead so bad that they some of them got in trouble to get into the jail there so they could get a shot at him you know, so here he is and with this psychotic guy, and uh, here's these gangsters throwing notes under his door saying, uh, we're here. We're waiting for you. We're just waiting for a chance to get you. Man. So um, this was this was a breakthrough for me on uh, because I, what I thought is that uh, what, what, what there was was an a energy drop with, with the psychotic voices. Uh, when they attacked, the person's energy was just drained, and it was consistent. There's a one-to-one correlation between the voices attacking the person and their energy disappearing. And uh, when I ran into this case, I, I called the um, called the the uh, same guy up first and and watched him come up the staircase. And he had plenty of energy. He didn't have to use the guardrail. He he. Uh, a brisk walk, walk over to the control room sure. where the interview office was, sat down, and uh, he, he was nervous. I mean, sure, you, you, you know, you're under those circumstances with a lunatic in, in your this small cell, and there's nowhere to go. Right. You know, and the gangsters had tried to pay the, the crazy guy off to, to hurt this guy also. I don't know if he knew that or not. Um uh, so I talked to him and he goes, you know, th- this guy's out of it. He's, he's, he's standing over me, staring at me at three in the morning. And he's, he's totally three sheets to the wind. He's crazy. Uh, he said, you got to get me out of there. You know, I said, well, I'll, I'll do what I can do. But, you know, we might sure. be able to drug him or whatever. I'll, I'll report it, but I don't have the power to move you. That's not within my purview. Um, so I let him go. And then I called up the, the crazy guy and watched him come up the steps and, and he he could barely make it up the steps, just very slow. He used the hard rail, guard rail. He kind of shuffled over to the office, sat down, and then it was like, uh, you know, in the chair, no energy. 
And I asked him, you hearing voices? He said, yeah, I hear them all the time. I said, are they, they strong? He said, yeah, they're really strong. Man. And uh, um, I asked him, do they, do they drain your energy? He said, yeah, they, they got me drained all the time. And, uh, you know, after I saw that, you know, what I was thinking was that the energy was drained because these guys were so, um, uh, the voices are so nasty. You know, they, they are, they're very nasty. And if you were having to listen with to that 24 hours a day, you know, you'd think that would be draining. But in this case, I've watched these two. I mean, it was a perfect experimental situation. Um, they had the same cell, they had the same beds, they had the same food, they had the same guards. I mean, it was, you couldn't set up a, a, a more perfect experimental situation. And when, after I saw the, the two of them, I went, it's not, it's not due to the anxiety. Right. There's something else that is taking away their energy. Um, and it, I was pretty sure it was the voices, although I wasn't completely positive what the voices were. Uh, but th that that changed my mind right there. Um, so you, you may have that, you know, that that guy, uh, the, the, the normal guy was stuck with this raving maniac. Oh, that's horrible. In there, you know, so they're, they're, set, they're stuck with cellmates that way. Yeah. Um, and so really what you're saying is it didn't just affect the energy of the guy that had the voices. It also affected the energy of the, the person that was in the room with him. Yeah, to some degree, although the, the normal guy had a whole lot more energy than he sure. did. And that's what happens in families, too. You have a schizophrenic. I was just going to say that. Yeah. yeah. You have a schizophrenic in the family. He affects the whole family. The whole family gets drained. Yeah. Well, and that's why it's so important to get the deliverance from this. And it's what the work that you're doing is is really amazing. And there's a lot of people that had asked about um, the MACE. Is it M-A-C-E or M-A-Z-E? No, it's M-A-C-E, the MACE Energy Method. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to... So I've, I've been using that for more than two years now, and it works better than anything I've ever seen. You know, it actually works. They ought to be using that in all the... Uh, all the prisons. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, but, and all uh, the families that have somebody like this, I mean, if they can find somebody like you that can help them with the mace energy method, rather than going down the, the crazy pharma route. Um, and it's really a merry-go-round. Do you find yeah. that with the mace energy method, it, there is like a point where you have to re-deliver it? Um, or is no. it? Wow. Once it's done, it's done. That's so cool. You know, once, once, once that the problem is, is, you know, somebody feels they're worthless. I mean, in an hour, that's gone. You know, they struggled with it all their life. I wow. mean, it's, it's pretty amazing stuff. Yeah, but, you'd think you know, somebody this, like Dr. Amen or somebody that's doing all the brain scans, they would want to collaborate with somebody like, like Mace. Yeah, there's other energetic therapies coming out also. So, it, it looks like there's a small segment of, of the um, psychotherapy population moving in that direction. There's also a, a group of what they call them spirit, spirit releasers mm -hmm. who they charge a lot of money, but they can get rid of the voices. Yeah, it's like deliverance. The, it, well, you kind of like they, they kind of talk them out into the light. Sure. So if, if you can talk one into the light, they're gone for good. Oh, that's you know, so cool. There, there's a lot of them don't want to go. You know, they, they, they don't trust anybody, and especially the higher up ones. So there's there's different levels mm -hmm. of, of these entities there. Yeah. Um, and so I have a question. Like, so you know how some, some people trauma triggers their DID. Do they know what triggers schizophrenics? Well. Th or if something so it's, does? It's, well, what what brings it on is usually uh, meth is one. I mean, okay. meth. I, I've seen more prisoners right. in in the in the prison with meth than than any other drug. So, when you talk about part of the, I mean, they become as psychotic as anybody in the state hospital. So, what happens with them? They start using meth. They feel like they're supermen. They feel great. They have a lot of energy. They, you know, they stay up for get all kinds of stuff done and. Uh, it feels wonderful until they crash. Okay. And then they start hearing voices when they're up and they go, oh, that's just a hallucination. You know, they go, okay, well, they, they ignore it. 
and and then when they come down, it goes away. And then that happens several more times. It may happen for a few months, and then one day they don't go away. And they're just as psychotic as anybody else, and they're, they're permanently, you know, the prison is full of these kind of people. So that's why I say 20 to 25%, because you have all these meth addicts flowing sure. in there from wow. all the meth being brought across the border. You know, it's easy to get it. And mm -hmm. then you have the psychiatric mafia prescribing, uh, I've seen another, a, a number of prisoners who, you know, they, their, their kids are bouncing off the wall like kids do. And the, the psychiatric mafia fills them full of Ritalin or, or Adderall, which is an amphetamine. And I asked them, I said, what, well, you know, did it work for you? Oh, yeah, it worked for me. I could concentrate. It calmed me down. And uh, I asked them, well, if, if it was working well for you, then why did you keep increasing it? Why did you keep going out into the street and buying more and more meth? And their answer was, I don't know. Yep. And then well, the brain adjusts. Prison. Just like yeah, it does with alcohol, I would imagine. Yeah, I don't I'm know. If there's a, I don't know if there's a tolerance effect with meth. I've I've never heard him talk about it. Oh, okay. You know, but uh, you know, Sounds a lot like of them are in, in there for drugs. You know, so they they can't get any psychological help uh, out on the streets. Right. You know that you you go to these mental health centers and they're overwhelmed. You know, they 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 have these young counselors who don't know what they're doing. Um, and, and they just burn them out. They pay them little, they burn them out, you know? So it, what they set up is the psychiatric mafia and big pharma have these private hospitals now that are just merry-go-rounds, you know, and the prison is too. There's mm -hmm. like a 70% recidivism rate. It's so for, high. For prisoners it's, within and three it's years. So expensive. I mean, I remember, and this was years ago um, when we were looking at the stats. It was anywhere from thirty to a hundred thousand dollars a year per per prisoner. Um, it seems to me to be a lot cheaper to get the mace method going for everybody. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, it would. Uh, although it's not a high volume method. You know, I only see two people a day, and that's all I could deal with. You know, that's that's it because it does take it out of you. Um, sure. And, uh, and I'm supposed to be retired, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's not high volume, but you look at, you look at the recidivism rate, you know, BF Skinner, like what, 80 years ago or something like that. He, he proved that punishment doesn't work. You know, but what it does is suppress behavior while the stimulus, while somebody's standing over him with a baseball bat, right? you know, it'll suppress the behavior. But if that, if that, uh, whatever standing over them, if that influence is removed, that bad behavior shoots up above baseline back and then back down to where it was to start with. So punishment doesn't work. Now, there's a lot of those prisoners in there. They need to be in there. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. They, they can't, they can't function in society. And I, I've, I've watched them leave some of the, uh, some of the really psychotic ones out uh, because they'd done their time. I mean, mm -hmm. there's one guy I knew he'd kill somebody within six months. Oh, my gosh. You know, and they they give him $50 and turn him loose on, on the street, said, okay, you're free. You know, what's that guy going to do? He doesn't have $50. What's that? that won't even pay for a hotel for a night. You know, it's what, food. what's he going to do? Food, food and a prayer. And are are any of them, like, um, getting involved in, in you know, biblical things? Because I know there's a lot of ministries that go into prisons because, I mean, we did. Um, ours was a 501c3, not a ministry, but you know what I'm asking. Yeah. So uh, what they had in our prison were uh, a group of fire-breathing fundamentalists. You yeah, know? that's and, not going to work. That, that doesn't work real well. So I was in charge of volunteer services for a while, and I, I would let, uh, you know, I'd let the Mormons in, I'd let the Harry Krishna's in, I'd, I'd let the meditators in, the Buddhists, I mean, anybody like that. And then these these fire-breathing um, uh, preachers went to the warden and said, hey, look, we don't like what he's doing. He's letting in all these heathens. You, know? <laughs> you pagan, we, you pagan helper. Yeah, we want him out of there. So the, the, the warden pulled me out. I said, well, listen, you got all these fire-breathing guys. A lot of these prisoners don't want it don't want want that crap they right. don't want that stuff thrown in their face right you know they, they, they everybody has their own level that so right. 
increase the number so the people will, the prisoners will migrate to the level they're at instead of the only choice they have are these fire breathing, you know, uh, you're going to burn in hell preachers. <laughs> you know? and, uh, I get some of those people writing comments on my channel. <laughs> it's it's not fun and so uh gosh it's so it's just to me it's like a whole other world and then you had sent me that article about how they're just building bigger and bigger prisons like there's some billion dollar prison that you sent me that article about yeah yeah and and yeah the prisons are packed yeah they're packed they're, they're you know which which increases this, the stress on staff and and like you were saying it's it's much more expensive to keep these guys in prison than it was to keep them in a mental hospital because they have all the security, all the guards, all the, you know, the, all the extra attention you have to pay to them where the mm -hmm. mental patient should just kind of let them run around on the ward and do their thing, you know, and they, uh, you know, babble to one another and, and, you know, make friendships and, yeah, um, you know, they, they, they didn't require unless somebody went off and was hurting somebody else. Sure. Uh, they, they didn't require that kind of security, that kind of control, mm -hmm. you know. And then if the the ones that were really bad, they just, you know, drug them until they were drooling. You know, it's, uh, but, you know, so so they shot themselves in the foot by getting rid of the state hospitals mm -hmm. where it was much cheaper to deal with these guys than it is in prison. Yeah, except so, for the private, the private jails probably or the private prisons probably wanted to make the money. Um, it was probably one of the things that they wanted to do. I mean, I'm sure this was an intentional thing. The more I look at it, do you agree? What the private prisons? Just to keep people. Yeah, they're making it. It is a an enterprise. It's not. It it's is not, an enterprise. Yeah. Okay. It, it 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 it's that's exactly what it is. There there's no rehabilitation programs that I saw there. Mm -hmm. They weren't really trying to help the guys. They were just it was a human holding tank. Sure. You know that that uh, they they spent as little money on anything as they possibly could. The the wardens got paid very well. You know they got cars and they got a big salary. Everybody else was paid crap. So a lot of the a lot of the uh, guards from the private prison would go back to the state prison. So they had a bunch of newbies all the time that didn't know what they were doing. They didn't have any experienced people. You know, and the turnover in the rate in the prison is horrendous, also, sure. because they treat their staff like the prisoners. You know, it, it's like you. It was the only place that I've ever worked where nobody wanted to be there. You know, except maybe a couple of the wardens. That was it. But nobody else, the prisoners don't want to be there. The staff didn't want to be there. Nobody wanted to be there. Nobody wants to be yeah. there. Nobody wants the drugs. <laughs> There's got to be a better way. And so do you see that there is a better way that would be less expensive even if that entailed still having prisons or still having, you know, mental institutions, like if you, <clears throat> if it was Jerry's world, how would you establish and how, what would you do? Well, that's a tough question because it requires a lot of money, no matter what you do, you know, and then, then you have to have the support of the legislature. They don't want to give the prisons any money. You know, and and they were corrupt. I mean, they lost a freaking bulldozer, uh, an entire bulldozer, disappeared, it's missing. They, they they had uh, what correctional industries where they had these prisoners working for, you know, twenty five fifty cents an hour for this corporation, and they were losing the money. They couldn't keep track of the money. So you you have this level of corruption within the prison, also within their system. Yeah. So give us some examples of, of the corruption that you either heard about or witnessed yourself. Well, one, one big one was this arrogant. Uh, so we were under the medical section. The, the, the psychology department came under medical. And this arrogant alcoholic um, chief medical officer for the state, the whole state prison system. He decides that he wants to create a, a electronic medical record system for um, the entire state prison. 
Okay, so he buys the computer first. All right, he's got them all stored up, and then he he starts working on creating, paying to create the software for them. And then the software got so big it would no longer run on those computers. So he has a million dollars worth of computers stacked up in a warehouse there, and now he doesn't have any software to uh, to run on it because he's paid these guys a fortune to develop that software and they will no longer run on these, these computers. So here's a million dollars of taxpayer money just swept under the table and, and those computers disappeared. I mean, they could have used them in the programs that I had developed, but no, those, those, they just vanished, you know? So it's, it's, it's very corrupt. It sounds a lot like politics. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, like the the hundred dollar hammers or whatever it is that people end up, you know, that the taxpayers are paying for. And so, you know, of a, a missing backhoe or bulldozer, and yeah. all kinds of computers just wasted sitting yeah. in a warehouse. Yeah. Those, those were the two big ones. I mean, those were the massive ones. And then, uh, you know, they. The... Well, I also, I I would imagine that if these prisoners are doing work for pennies for a corporation, not the state. How does, how is that legal? Well, they had to come up with something that uh, wouldn't um, compete with something in the private sector. Okay. So for a while they were making like uh, bags for pilots, federal pilots to, to carry their, um, helmets in so it had to be something to wasn't because they started doing all this other stuff and then all these private guys going hey we can't compete with uh, 75 percent you know 50 cent labor you know so they stepped in and they stopped a lot of the the programs that they had uh, but you know the the rehab programs disappeared they used to have an auto mechanics thing there where they teach them auto they mechanics teach them stuff, they had yeah. they had a farm they had all these different vocational courses there uh, so they still had GED while I was there. They had a small college program for for some of them, but most of them they didn't have anything for. You know, they they would go out and uh, uh, the minimum custody unit would um, send these people out. So they they ran the prison with the inmates for the mo- for the most part. So they had these trustees, and uh, I remember one time when I was I was working minimum custody. They were ordered. They had to go through the psych department when they, when they wanted to employ any seriously mentally ill inmate. Okay. <laughs> wow. So, so we'd take a look at him and say, yeah, either yeah, this guy could do it, or or no, he's too dangerous. Okay. So the warden of that unit just completely ignored that. And then one day I, I come to work and I'm. Uh, I had a, a pass out for this one inmate who was, he, he had murdered his wife with a butcher knife okay. oh my and God. He, he was psychotic and he didn't show up. So I'm like, Hey, where is this guy? So I, I went to check and the warden had assigned him to a job in the kitchen where he was peeling potatoes with a butcher knife. You can't make this up. No, you can't make this up. So I could, I, I found that hard to believe. So I went over to the central kitchen looked up where he was and here he is sitting there with this big butcher knife peeling potatoes. And I'd look at the guard and I said, this guy murdered his wife with one of those. You know, and he's like, you know, cause they don't, they don't tell the guards anything. You know, so I went to the chief oh medical gosh. officer and uh, I said, listen, this ain't good. So he pulled the guy out of there and, and he, he gave the warden a hard time. And then the warden pulled me in and started giving me this stuff like, oh, oh, oh you really think he was dangerous? I mean, uh, uh, and I, I kind of looked at him. Oh, my gosh. And, and I, I, I just started laughing so hysterically. I, it, he was so ridiculous that I fell on the floor in front of him at his feet <laughs> and I was just laughing. <laughs> and he, he, what could he do? Like, you know, it, said, how I'm ridiculous just, is this? Yeah, it was like, I can't believe this. This is just out of it. You know, uh, so Man. he was trying to fill his quotas. You know, they, they, they have quotas that they have to fill for workers uh, at different places. Um, 
And so were there certain things that worked better? Like, like while you were talking, you know, you were talking about how they used to have the auto mechanics, they used to have college, they used to have the farm. Like, I don't know, when you were saying it, I started thinking, gosh, the farm thing seems like such a great idea to be outdoors in nature, working with animals. I would think that would be such a great thing to keep going. Yeah, they grew their own food. It was working fine. And then for some reason, they stopped it. You know, so as more and more, see that their their resources are are always almost on an emergency level. You know, their staffing is always low. Their medical staffing is always low. Their guards are low. Their uh, the staffing is at minimal levels. Right in there. So right. there's a lot They're of trying stress to maximize for profits, there. or well, not spend as much of the federal money. What well, does every prison have? a therapist or, I mean, I know they have a medical ward, you know, in case something happens, but do, do all of them have access if they need well, it? All, all, all the ones I know and, and the ones I worked with in other places have a psych department. So basically what our deal was, was to keep track of the inmate population and watch for these guys coming in. So every new guy that came onto the unit that had a mental health history, we'd interview them and see what kind of shape they were in, and then refer them to the psychiatrist. Now, but then when they when they started this uh, corrupt crap with the uh, chief psychologist cutting off the medicines, you know, and, you know, what they did from there, and when, when, when he saw what I had written in the medical record, he, he went, he went, he got hysterical, and he put another psychologist over me to watch every record that I wrote to get their approval, you know, so that had never happened before. And I told him, I said, uh, you know, I'll play your game until another situation like this comes up and then I'm going to do what I have to do. You do whatever you do, but this is temporary, you know, because mm-hmm. one will come up. And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'll be going somewhere else. And yeah. so you, you went from Georgia, then you went to Arizona prison and was that where you retired from? Or at least thought you were yeah. retiring. Well, yeah, I, ba- I bailed out of there because when when schizophrenic started recovering, you know, that that wasn't supposed to happen. You know, so when I found out that these vo- these these um, the voices they were hearing were actual entities, and they were running patterns, and I started doing things to interfere with those patterns. Mm-hmm. You know, they kind of throwing monkey wrench into the patterns to see what had happened. And then the prisoners started coming back and going, the voices don't like that. They don't like what you're doing, you know. And, um, you know, it, finally we figured out ways to attack the voices. And Sherry came up with her That's a Lie program. You know, so 98% of what they tell patients are lies. You know, sure. What they want to do is they want to upset them. And it's only after they upset them that they can take their energy. And that's what they're after. They're after that energy, but it has to be at a low level, you know. So that's why they're constantly negative and abusive and rotten, because they have to bring down the person's energy level to that low vibration, and then they can somehow take it. They and siphon how they it. do that, I have no idea how they do it. Well, I think but they're doing they, they it do with it. with all kinds of things. I think they're doing it um, with anything where they can divide people or, on any subject or through the news or. Um, you know, scaring people with with stories or whatever. I I do believe there there is siphoning going on of some sort. Now, what I meant, I don't know how they actually siphon it. I don't know yeah. how they how they do it. Right. But you're right about the con. You know, the prison was the biggest feeding ground for these negative entities that I've I've ever been in in my life. The state hospital was nowhere as bad as as the prison. You walk into the prison door and you could just feel it. You know, it was just. Uh, you know, I remember I flew with the Civil Air, uh, Arizona Civil Air Patrol for like 23 years. And I remember there was one morning where we, we went out on an early flight. And then I came back after flying all over Arizona and the, the beautiful mountains and seeing everything from there. I had to go back to the prison, which was right near the airport. And going from that into the prison was like a psychic trauma. It was like, oh, man, you know, you can really feel it then. Yeah, I I feel that way walking into hospitals, too. Do you get that feeling from a hospital at all? 
Uh, no, I never got uh, the psych hospitals a little bit, but from a regular hospital, mm -hmm. uh, no. But I, you know, I watched what they did there too. It was like after I retired from the prison, I went and worked psych crisis for the emergency rooms in the major hospitals around, oh, okay. around town. For, for I didn't 10 know years. this part. Yeah, ten years I did that, and you know, here's here's all these guys coming in. You know, the police are dragging them in. Um, you can see they're heading for prison. You know, and and all they do is they they uh, they didn't in the emergency room they didn't want you working with anybody. You know, they wanted you determined the guy goes in, he goes out, or you, they wanted him out of there as quick as they could get him out. They wanted him out because the doctors have no idea what to do with crazy people. You know, so they turn them over to the psych staff and then we'd have to figure out, can we send them back to the family? Do we have to send them to a mental health center? Do we have to arrange for a mental health, whatever, whatever it took to, to get him out of there. Or did they commit a crime? Cause sometimes, you know, there's like, you know, shootouts or whatever, and they end up in, in where you are. And then once they're healed, then do you talk to them? I mean, is that something that would ever happen? In the, in the hospital, yeah, there were a lot of suicide things oh, okay. where we had to go up and determine whether the guy was uh, uh, suicidal or not, you know, still suicidal. So, you know, the doctor's like, okay, we we want to get him out of here, but we can't release him until one of you guys come up and say they're not suicidal anymore. You know, and if you blew one of those, you were fired. <laughs> Oh yeah, it's I like, could imagine. That would be very stressful. How did you how did you like <laughs> decompress from this type of stuff? Oh geez. Uh, yeah, it was stressful. Uh you know, I remember there were times I I broke out into rashes. Um I'd jump on a motorcycle and just take off. Um I did that. Uh work the, the flights with the Civil Air Patrol were nice, you know, to get out and fly around for a while. Um, yeah, and, and just kind of try to stay. I remember one time I got in a motorcycle accident and I was so happy. I, my, my leg was snapped because I didn't have to go back to work at the prison. Oh my God. I mean, it, for me, it was like heaven, not so having to you go You must back. feel really free now, now that like the work that you're doing is so impactful and you're in demand and people are flying you around the world and paying for your trips. Does it feel good? Oh yeah, I mean it's like it's the opposite. The, 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 there were there were some of us who knew no good deed can, can, will go unpunished in the prison. Mm -hmm. You know, you do something good, it's not going to work. You know, because these these negative entities control that place. And Sherry Sweeney, the, my co-author, she she was uh, working doing working pr with a prison one time. She had a group of. Um, uh, kind of people who were kind of meditating and sending positive energy into the prison. Okay. And one night she went to do that. And she said, this smoke appeared in her room, just came out of nowhere, this dark cloud of black smoke. And it said, Excuse said me, to her, the these people, these people are ours. They're mine. You know, you have no right to be doing this. And uh, yeah, that was pretty spooky. That you know, is so really spooky. It, it's like when they said, you know, they're 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 mine. You know, it's kind of it's a, it's like a principality rather than you know, it's like it's like okay, here's these people that are afflicted by these entities or these parasites or whatever it is, um, these voices. But then they're all congregating in this area where there's a lot of criminals with, you know, dark behavior as well. And it's yeah. almost like they take over the actual space, the the environment, the the yep. building, yep. the bricks, the and this yep. is ours. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, I remember one time the, the voices were telling me, you have no right to interfere with our way of life. You know, I mean, straight out, came out to, out of this one prisoner, and he said, that wasn't me, that was them. You know, so you, you look at that, and the, the prison is just full of anxiety and fear. I mean, they're threatening each other, they're raping each other, they're stabbing each other, they're extorting each other, um, they're extorting families on the outside. Uh, 
Uh, they're threatening all the time. There, there's constant fights. There's murders. I mean, this one high, high um, custody unit I, I worked on. You walk in in the morning, there's blood all over the sidewalks. You know. Um, I mean, think about it, that. It, that is so satanic, almost. Yeah, it's a very negative environment. A very negative environment, and they're, they're constantly. It's like it's like hell on earth. You know, they're constantly testing each other out. What can I get away with? What will this guy stand for? What, what can I mow him over? Can I extort him? Can I, you know, what can what can I do? You know, and uh, you know, they're raping each other. They're stabbing each other. They're. I watched this one film where the, the gangsters wanted this one guy taken care of, and they had a weight pile. So here's this one inmate with he, the weights are off, and here's this iron bar, you know, and he's kind of got it, and he's swinging it on his shoulders. This other inmate brings the victim, and they're walking along, and then he moves aside, and this guy with the bar just took it and swing it. It's cracked him in the back of the head with it and killed him, you know, right on the video. Oh, my gosh. You know, so that, that kind of stuff going on all the time, people getting stabbed. They had the, what they called shanks. They'd make homemade knives out of pieces of steel. Um, you know, they they uh, they get drugs in all different kinds of ways. And if you run into a drug debt and you can't pay it, you're in trouble. You know, your life is at risk. And so there were there were always people dying in there. There was, I remember one time um, the, the when when I worked for the medical unit, but I wasn't like a nurse or a doctor or anything like that. But the the prisoners would come to me when something was seriously wrong, and the regular medical people wouldn't see them. You know, so they were very regimented also. And uh, what I'd do is I'd go out and I'd look at the guy and I'd, if he looked bad to me, I'd go and I'd get the psych nurse and then I'd take her out there. So there, there was one guy, uh, he was one of, one of our psych patients, he was on lithium. And in Arizona, it gets so hot, he sweated out a lot of water. So his lithium level increased to the point where it was toxic. And I went back and got the psych nurse and I said, you know, Debbie, oh. you probably need to take a look at this guy. So she did, brought him in. He was on his way out. He was dying. You know, so we saved him. And then both of us got called up in front of administration and told that that was none of our business, that we shouldn't have done that. You know. No good deed goes unpunished, as you say. Yeah. But it goes back to um, the truth set you free. The fact that you are an honest man, you saw the mistakes and the dirty dealings and the corruption you did the best you could, but when you finally got out and told the truth, your whole life has just kind of opened up and become so incredible and so important. You, there's so many people that have seen your video. It's, it's, it's at least in my, in my subscriber group, it's you're among the favorites because people have been so gaslit by society. Oh, yeah. And so it's yeah. just so it, it feels so good to have anyone telling you the truth, especially somebody that has credentials that has encountered the things that you've encountered. And then two, to be able to, to be honest and say, you know, this is something bigger than this. Isn't just psychology. This is spiritual attacks. This is somebody's yeah. being attacked by an entity. There's a place and, and Satan owns it and there's blood on the sidewalks and there's, there's a principality claiming power over all these people. And, um, and so to me, you know, it goes back to how could you fix it? Is there a way to fix it? To me, this, I'll tell you, in my opinion, it really is who owns the prisons who's running the prisons, regardless of the amount of money. If it, if a dirty person that is only in it for the profit or to keep the prices down, they're going to not care anything about what's in there, what goes on there. Nothing. Like you said, like a human holding tank. Whereas yeah, if it was, I just imagine like, like this, like a prison where, you know, there's grandmas on the cameras and they're like, Oh wait, that person's being naughty or, you know, get that one away from there. I feel like there, it, it can't be that difficult, but maybe I'm oh, naive. Uh, no, no. Yeah, it would be. Yeah. You, you got, it, it goes up, up the line, just like the demons, you know, they have their, their levels. So 
you you've got these these um directors these prison directors but that's what that i'm saying given... it's good people not crappy directors yeah. well you know they want somebody who's going to keep the cost down right that's my point you know to do whatever they need to to keep the cost down yeah and some of these guys are just you know they were going to charge uh staff for for char uh parking in the parking lot you know the uh, the raises were, were virtually non-existent in, in the prison system. You know, it's always strapped for money. You know, they're like the, uh, uh, what do you call it, tail end Charlie of everything else. And they're putting more and more people in there. And and you, you got, you, you hear on the news, oh, this murder escaped. He, he's running loose in the neighborhood. Everybody lock your doors and get your guns out. And they, here's the mainstream media broadcasting all this bull crap and scaring everybody half to death. What they don't know is they're releasing 25 or 30 of these guys every <laughs> freaking day. They've done that their, doesn't they, make us feel better. Their, <laughs> they've done their time and it's right. okay. We can't hold them anymore. They've done their time. They've paid their debt to society. And they're coming out of there in worse shape than what they ever went in. And these psychotics, that are already psychologically disturbed. Right. And then you put them under that kind of pressure with gangsters and, and being beat and, and being fighting and, and threatening them. They come out in much worse shape. They're much colder, much more calculating. So, you know, prisons are like a graduate school for, for criminals. You know, they compare things. Hey, uh, how'd you get caught? Well, I got caught this way. Well, yeah, I knew better than not do that. Maybe you won't do that next time. You know, it's like, uh, uh, it, it's nuts. And, and you know, the, the, some of the stories the prisoners told me, especially the meth addicts, you know, they, they told me, and more than one of them said, when I ran out of meth, the voices would tell me where to go and when to be there to get more meth. And they said they would show up at that spot at the time they were told and somebody with the meth would come around. Some complete stranger who had meth would, would show up. If that doesn't make you believe in vibration, I don't know what does. You know, um, I had a, a friend of mine whose son um, was addicted to heroin. And she's like, he literally landed in Miami and he had a heroin overdose in like an hour. How in the world does that happen? <laughs> you know, I've seen them. They they get on the phone it's and like they, they call find somebody. each other. They, they, they have some kind of secret line or something. I've seen that happen. You know, um, it's it is and, wild. And so, give us just one one more take on, or one more story, or something. Um, so I don't want to take up your whole evening, but just one more one more story that has to do with. Anything well, that has to do with teaching people about prisons, the teaching, teaching well, the average I, person that doesn't know anything about it. What pops into my mind is um, uh, what, what some of the gangsters were doing with the, um, well, there's two, two stories that come to mind. The, the gangsters were doing with some of these psychotic inmates that were part of their gang. You know, so what happens is, is psychotics when they get upset they become supernaturally strong. I mean, just, it's, it's amazing. I'll give you, I'll tell you a story after this where, where there's one, but so what they did is they, they forced this guy off his medications, told him not to take them. And then they started making up these stories about this rival gang saying, Hey, see that guy over there, the leader of that gang, you know, he, he's going to kill you. You better go do something about him. You know, so they'd arm him and use him like human torpedoes. You know, send him over to, to stab the leader, and uh, uh, you know that they would uh, like a kamikaze pilot. Kamikazes, yeah. And then there, there was a you know, another time. This was another. This was in a, a more maximum security uh, cell in another prison. Um, the what happened is they they were trying to move this one big psychotic guy out of his cell and wanted to move him to another cell. So a couple of guards came, got to his door and said, uh, hey, uh, Joe, you know, cuff up. We're, we're moving you. He goes, I'm not going anywhere. You know, hey, cuff up, cuff up. You know, we're, we're, we, we need to move you. No, I'm not, I don't want to go anywhere. Yeah. Okay, we're going to get the pepper spray. So, so they had these, these quart cans of pepper spray. 
And uh, the guy said, uh, I'm not coming at you, bunch of fairies. Come in and get me if you want me. And uh, so they got the pepper spray. They opened the hatch. And the prisoner was sitting on his bed, and he wrapped his head in a towel, and they just soaked him with pepper spray. It was so bad that it came out of the cell, and they were suffering from it. You know? And uh, you know, he took the towel off, and they, they said, now come on out, you know. He goes, no, come in and get me, you bunch of fairies, you bunch of, you know, just calling them all kinds of names and saying, you want me to come in and get me? Now, what they could have done was turned off the water, you know, so he had no water, and then get, not given him any food. In a couple of days, he would have come out of there, you know, but no. So when this started, you have these three cells of prisoners all watching the show down there. So now the guards can't back down because here's all these other prisoners saying so they gotta hey, you know keep their egos well, yeah yeah if we back down then we lose status so, you know so they had to up the ante so they went and got these uh, stun guns these fifty thousand volt stun guns and they'll just knock i mean i've seen them knock down the biggest guy just like that i mean just boom they go down so they went and got it got one and they shot this guy with it and he's standing in the middle of his cell and he's just quivering he's just shaking you know he's like that but he's not going down and That's then when amazing. They, when, I, yeah, they, 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 they're almost supernaturally strong. They are. It's, they it's absolutely crazy. are supernatural. They, That's not normal. No, that was not normal at all. So they went and got another stun gun. So they had two 50,000 volt stun guns. Each one would have knocked down the biggest prisoner that, I, you know, normally. And, and the, here they are alternating. One's discharging while the other one's charging up. They did it 13 times. By then, there's more guards there. And the warden came down. And he said, uh, hey, you better stop it. I'm going to get charged with cruel and unusual punishment. 13 times, and this guy still would not go down. Because they and, were uh, fairies. <laughs> they was, yeah, he's calling wow. them fairies, calling them all kinds of names, you know, insulting them in any way he could think of. And then he said, you want me out of there? You come on and get me. None of them were going to do that, not after what they saw. So they, they told him, you know, you don't come out of there. We're going to go get the dog. The prisoners were terrified of the dogs because these are trained, expensive attack dogs. I mean, they're trained. They just rip you apart. You know, they they were terrified of the dogs. They're more terrified than any anything else. Pepper spray, uh, you know, the stun guns. I mean, the, the dogs were because they, they they really put the hurt to them. Yeah. If they resisted. They just tear them to pieces. Well, dogs so, have naturally high frequencies, too. That might bother them as well. <laughs> Well, they got the, this trained attack dog. They brought him in and, uh, you know, they opened the hatch and said, now, come on out of there. We're going to take sick the dog on you. And he goes, it's the same stuff. You go, come on in and get me, you bunch of fairies, you know. So they they opened the door. They sick the dog on him. He, he's sitting on his bed and the dog leaped at him and he threw up his arm in front of his face like that. And the dog grabbed onto his arm, just bit right down to the bone. Oh, God. So what he did is he pulled the dog up to his face just like this. And he's looking the dog in the face and he goes, sit. And the dog sat, but it didn't let go of his arm. See, that's so supernatural he, too. That's really weird. And then he starts petting the dog like nice puppy. While his, while his arms gushing blood and the thing's clamped down to the bone, he's going, nice puppy, nice puppy. And all everybody outside's going, what the blazes is going on in there? So they they had a rope on the dog and they pulled the dog and the dog kept his mouth on the, on the, this, this prisoner. Mm -hmm. They pulled him out of the cell and then they beat the crap out of him. Oh gosh. You know. Yeah. I don't know how you survived so many years of that. that is oh, just it, was, it was, it was tough. So it, low it, it, vibes, it so low vibes, yeah. so scary, such dark entities. You are a I, miracle. I never belonged there. I, I, you know, there were some guys who belonged there. I didn't, I never belonged there ever. Maybe the first 10 years I did. But after that, it was like, no. I felt like I was a, somebody in a spacesuit walking on Mars or something. Yeah. Well, that's the way a lot of people feel just on being on Earth. Yeah. <laughs> it's, not, and, it's not exactly a really friendly place to be unless you then, really then, know then, how to maneuver it. Yeah. Then when they found out the schizophrenics were recovering, which is oh, something yeah. that they didn't believe ever should happen. So they would go off their meds. They didn't need them anymore. So they'd visit with the psychiatrist and they go, I don't need these anymore. And the, the psychiatrist, what do you mean you don't need them anymore? Well, I was working with this guy and uh, the, the voices are gone. 
So it's like they're wondering, well, what, what, what's going on here? What's, what's happening? So, uh, how dare you heal these people? How, how dare you heal these people? And then when the the chief psychologist, the same guy, who who did the he cut off the meds to the the medical unit, when he found out about this, I thought he'd be happy, you know, because oh that saves the meds. You know, they don't have to pay for these expensive meds anymore. The guy's back to normal. He can go live a, a normal life. Now, this didn't happen a lot, you know, because it's a lot of work. It took maybe six months to just for these, you know. But eventually, these guys wanted to recover, and we right. they recovered. You That's know? awesome. And uh, so they started this investigation on me. None of the prisoners would tell them what, what we did in our sessions. You know, they knew what they were doing. And uh, they didn't tell him. So uh, one of them asked him, you know, what's he doing in there? What do you, what's he say to you in there? Because sometimes I'd go in there, I'd stay in with two, two or three hours I'd spend with one guy. And uh, the, the, the rest of them, they spend 20 minutes with him. They can't get anything out of him. They, they let him go. So that looked odd. That, that got their attention. And then when they started recovering, that really got their attention. And uh, they didn't know what was happening. And I remember the both of them, you know, my direct supervisor and the chief psychologist pacing like demons. You know, it was like they had ants in their pants. It was like something's really wrong here. Something's really wrong here. And it was like they were scared. And I'm like, what's going on with these people? I mean, we got we got a cure for schizophrenia. I mean, it it's working. And they're just pacing like demons back and forth, back and forth. Yeah. And then they put they, then they put me under investigation, started questioning all these guys I worked with. None of them would give them any answers. So the, the one psychologist said, uh, well, listen, we got a, a, a valid MMPI on you when you came into the prison and you were, you were, you were psychotic then, you, you were schizophrenic, and now you're telling me you're not, would you be willing to take another? He said, sure, I'll do that. And, uh, and then, he, then he was asking that guy, he says, what, what, what's Jerry doing with you in there? And he says, he's helping us, not like you, asshole. <laughs> <laughs> and that, he could have gone all day without saying that, you know. So that really pissed him off. And they gave him the second MMPI, and it came out as a valid profile and non-psychotic. Congratulations. Well, that didn't help me any. I know, apparently not. <laughs> then they really turned up the heat. You know, they really started questioning these guys. And uh, Did you uh, ever have moved... a philosophy on why? Because I agree with you. Like, as you're telling the story, I was thinking, okay, they would be happy that they're not having to pay for the drugs. Do you think it was just the psychiatrist's ego that he didn't want you to be doing something like that? Well, it wasn't the psychiatrist. It was the chief psychologist. It was the same guy oh, who was turning the... guys back from the medical yes, unit. Yes, yes. Okay. You know, and he was afraid. You know, he was afraid that, and what they what they were trying to charge me with was experimenting with prisoners without departmental uh, approval. Got and I would have never got I would have never got that. Right. So what they did is they knew I was doing something. They moved me to a Spanish unit where my Spanish is really bad, you know, so I really couldn't work with those guys like I could when I was in English. So uh, they were taken over too. I mean, it wasn't like, oh yeah, you're doing something. Like I told you, no good deed goes unpunished in the prison. You know, it's a very dark place. It's being run by, by negative entities, mm -hmm. you know, all the way, all the way down. All the way, yeah. Um, usually the, the wardens are, are, you know, hardcore, uh, and, and they get it from the top down, you mm -hmm. know, so they, they're ordered, um, you know, from the, you know, the top down that's, that's they pay them a lot, but boy, that they're then owned by the state, you know, they're the pawns of the state. You, sure. you get up at two, three in the morning, you get out to the unit and see what's going on out there. Not yeah. good. Not good. Were you ever there late at night? Or were you more of a just daytime I, person? It was mostly daytime, but I went out there, you know, once in a while at night, not often. And just kind of to see what it was like. Is it way worse? No, everything's quiet at night. They're all oh, locked okay. down in their cells. You know, yeah, they're not walking sleeping. around on the yard. Yeah, none of that kind of stuff. But they also test the staff to see what they can get away with with each staff. Mm -hmm. You know, how, how far they can push them. 
you know, I remember one time I was coming across the yard. It was like five o'clock. There's this big, huge black guy uh, doing something on the, you know, on the, on the path of, toward to where I, I needed to leave. Mm-hmm. And then he, he said some kind of slur, you know, at me. You can't let him get away with that. Right. You know, so, so I got pissed off. I went up to him looking at this guy. I mean, he had <laughs> arms as big as my legs. Yeah. And I said, you know, who, who do you think you are? I'll have you locked down. You don't see the light of day for the next 10 years, buddy. You know, and it's uh, he. I don't think he knew who I was, but he he saw me stand up to him, and he's like, whoa, 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 okay. You know, like <laughs> th- then I walked away, and I go, what the blazes did I just do? I mean, he could have broken me in half like a stick, you know. But you can't let him get away with you. So there's this constant testing going on, you know. And then the, then you got the in the female prisons, man. Uh, male male staff in female prisons. That, that's a really tough job. It's a very tough job. I can't even imagine. Did you have to work the female prisons as well? I did for a while, but it was more like the you know to go over there and evaluate somebody and then get out. Mm-hmm. So I I wasn't permanently assigned there. And so, what were um, the differences? Well, the women weren't quite as violent, but they were very cagey. They were very um, they were very seductive. They were yeah. very manipulative. Um, they, they were they were much more much more con artists, very very slippery mm-hmm. uh, kind of things. But I I remember one, um, you know, I was talking to her and it's sorry she said she got locked down for something, and she's she's in isolation, and uh, you know they they would only open the tray and she she didn't even have any lights in there. Uh, they'd open the thing, feed her her food, and uh, somebody, I think some somebody left her a Bible or something like that, and she was she was reading it, and uh, she goes, "Okay, if there's a God, uh, I want something." I forgot what she said she wanted, and and the next day it came into her cell, you know. So she's like. Uh, well, could that be real? And then she goes, well, if there's a God, I want a piece of German chocolate cake, which is impossible to get in a prison. I right. Mean, just, it, it, <laughs> That's it not just doesn't happen. exist there. Right. You know, so uh, the next day, her hatch pops open and in comes a piece of German chocolate cake. You know, and she goes, I knew there was a God then. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean... If they would let in different, you know, different religions, I mean, not like the Jehovah's Witnesses or the, you know, these right. far out ones. The but, really, the really intense know, ones, yeah. Yeah, yeah but, you know, Protestants and, and Jewish guys and maybe meditation guys and, and stuff like that. Let them in and le- let them just work with these people, you know. But, you know, I remember the training I went through. And I watched the training. They were giving these volunteers, and they were they were telling these the volunteers these people are animals. You can't trust anything they say or do. Never trust them with anything. They're not. You know, it was like the orientation they were given was like they weren't human beings. They were a different class of animal. You know, and, that, and that's what they were putting into the volunteers' head. Yeah. Well, it was interesting because when we were um, we would go visit. A- prisons or detention centers or whatever. And one of the times we, we had these um, leadership um, booklets and, and ethics and morals and stuff like that, that we were teaching them. And most of them had never even understood the concept of leadership, which blew my mind. You know, when they started telling them what leadership is, and some of you are leaders, but you're leaders for bad. And, you know, I was kind of amazed that they didn't even have the basics because I guess I thought even if you had horrible parents like you could see tv shows and you you see how you know usually the the arc is the hero learns a lesson somehow you know but they did not understand anything that had to do with good character good morals good ethics yeah leadership any of it yep and then it gets perpetuated generation to generation to generation yeah. You know, so so there were there were when I left, there were like three generations of 
of this one family that ended up in prison. Were they you in know? the same prison, like grandpa, dad, and son? No, not at the same time. Not at the I same time. Think. Okay. Because that they, would have been wild. Did. It was just generation after generation after generation. They just keep fostering it on, you know. And the probation, they have probation, but they, those guys are overwhelmed. You know, they they don't do a great job. And, and it takes a lot of time to monitor these guys. And uh, they don't have a whole lot of power. And the power they do have is to send these guys back to prison. You know, so, so the prisons are so overcrowded now, it's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, the, the demons hate Palm 23, Psalm 23. They can't, they can't stand it. You know, and and ninety one too. Yeah, that's so cool. So I had myself on mute and thought I was talking. <laughs> I keep trying to make sure I get rid of all the background noise. Thank you so much for coming. I really, really appreciate seeing you, and I love hearing about the good things that are happening to you after all those years of turmoil and just insanity. You were like literally at the gates of hell. Yeah. Yeah, and it felt like it. I, it. I'd get up in the morning and I'd tell my wife, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I don't want to go, you know, and just force myself to go there. So everybody was staying there for the retirement. You know, if they didn't have a good, nobody would be there. Right. You know, and a lot of people just couldn't make it through. And it was interesting. One day I was working in the ERs and one of the guards I knew from the prison came in and he was completely broke down. You know, he, he was completely shot. He left the prison he took his retirement out. He couldn't succeed outside. And and now he had a, a family and a house and all that stuff. And he, he couldn't, he just couldn't make it. He was just a, a mess. So I actually ended up having him admitted, you know, to, to the psych hospital. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, the, the turnover is horrendous. Well, you know, and, they and can't, it, it makes they sense. They can't keep people. Yeah, it makes sense. It would be very, very difficult. I mean, even just the stories I heard at the at the juvie prison, I, I just can't even believe. It's so outrageous to think that kids are being put there that already have problems. Yeah, they, you know, they ought to have mace therapists in all those places. Exactly. You know, that, would, that would solve the problem. But like I said, it's not a uh, it's not a high volume thing. Right. Is it expensive you know, therapy? Um, that depends on, on who's doing it. But I, I think uh, uh, my teacher says she charges like 250 for a full session, which is mm -hmm. to get rid of everything. You That's know, awesome. E everything. That's nothing. You know, so it might take, uh, might take three or four hours to run a full session. And does it work on depression and anxiety yeah. and things like that yep. as well? Yep. It has a hard time with schizophrenia. You know, that uh, the, there's a gray area there where, where you, you kind of, is it the voices or is it a negative identity that these guys have picked up along the line? Mm -hmm. You know, so it, it, the voices are always interfering. They don't want, you know, so you're, you're running a May session and if the voices are there, they don't want the person doing it. Sure. So they'll try to interfere. You know, to say stuff like "this is stupid" or "you don't go there," or, "don't do this." Uh, um, I remember so, one prisoner. We got rid of the voices, and when they left, he was stunned. It was like he almost fell out of the chair. And he said, "The silence is deafening," because he hadn't Aww. heard silence in decades. Yeah. And uh, you know, he was kind of a, a mellow schizophrenic. I mean, just uh, you know, very subdued. And he had a job working in um, uh, motor vehicle. So he's answering the phones for the motor vehicle department. Mm -hmm. And they moved me to the Spanish unit so I couldn't do any good. And uh, I, I stopped back there one day just, just to see how he was doing. And I said, how are you doing? Are you, the voice is still gone. He goes, no, I asked for him to come back because I was lonely. So after it's six like, months it's like of you know work. how there's some people that have to have a TV on all the time or, mm -hmm. you know, something. They want noise in the house. Um, I love it quiet. 
But when I was younger, I definitely like I would come home, turn the TV on, whether I was watching it or not. I just wanted the noise or the I don't know. But I've definitely outgrown that. But I could see I could see where they would do that. I mean, yeah. I don't I wouldn't if I were them, but <laughs> I, I, I see why they do it. Um, it's almost like a, a bad friend is better than no friends kind of a concept. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and they talk to them. I mean, they have conversations with them. I had conversations with them through the patient, you know. And uh, they're not—they're not really nice things. They're—they're. They're Did nasty. they ever say anything funny or ever anything? Um, no, always no. always predictably mean. Always predictably mean. So you wonder about that. It's like, why aren't they random like all other hallucinations? So the psychiatric mafia is saying, yeah, they're hallucinations. Why aren't they random like all other hallucinations? Why aren't they all over the place? They're consistently negative. You know, they're rotten. They're they're nasty. They sell, say all kinds of bad stuff about the person and anybody they're with. Why would they react so negatively to church or the Bible or, or prayers? Why, why does the 23rd Psalm make them writhe up like burned worms? I mean, you know, there's there's like 23 patterns that they run. And those are all on my website. Yeah, you so, told you shared them the last time, well, two times ago when you were on. And um, if anyone wants to know those, they're on that one and or on his website. And his website's been right here underneath us the whole time. And so um, give us just a couple of them. We'll end on a high note. It's just talking about, you know, being able to recognize some of these things. Oh, you mean the patterns? Yeah, just give us five of them. Okay, well, I'll give you five new ones. They foster and create negative emotion. We talked about that. They energetically drain their victims. They get louder after sunset. And they get Whoa. loudest around three in the morning. You know, they see psychiatry. The, they'll tell them, oh, just ignore them. They're hallucinations. I went and asked patients how that worked out for them. It didn't. They get louder when they're ignored. You know, they foster self-destructive behavior. They foster isolation. They want the schizophrenic locked in his room, away from everybody else. The parents are evil. They're nasty. They're rotten. Keep away from them. They want them all to themselves, locked in the room, listening to their dribble all day. That's the worst thing a schizophrenic parent could do is let their, their, their son or daughter sit in that room listening to those voices all the time. You know, so the, what they're doing is they're slowly moving to take over the person. The, right. So it goes yeah, from oppression so, to possession. Yeah. And, I, you know, I've the, the full possession is rare. I've only seen it a, uh, two or three times. And it, it was pretty scary. Ugly. Yeah. It would be so scary. Yeah. They're not even the same person anymore. It's, uh, it's so sad. I've got one story where they, uh, in the in the ER, the parent brought the, the son in and when the parents called him by his, his real name, his birth name, he would get furious and he would, he would start throwing things and threaten them and say, you know, Joe Blow is dead. I'm not him. You know, quit calling me that. You know? And uh, he'd actually get violent when they called him by his right name. It's so sad. It's so sad. I would be, I mean, devastated if something like that happened to someone I knew. Um, but I definitely do believe there's magic in the biblical thing. And I do believe yeah. it is a, it is a spiritual war. And I love that you guys are thinking out of the box and, and trying to find ways to heal people through, you know, this mace energy method or, or some of the other ones that you were talking about. So there's still hope out there. And imagine if like, if you could get rid of 25% of the prison population, you know, if everyone could participate in something like that. Well, well, they, you know, it's not just getting rid of the voices. It's, it's the frequency. So once the voices are gotten rid of or weakened, that person needs to get on a positive spiritual path and stay there. Otherwise these things are going to come back. They can't stall out. Yeah. You know, they have to start moving toward God or, or whatever their higher power is. And, and stay there because if, if they, it's not like when you get an infection and you take an antibiotic and it goes away, you know, you get rid of the voices, you've got to keep doing stuff to keep them away. 
and that means staying on a positive spiritual path and, and moving toward your creator. You and know? amen, and that's true for everyone. That's all true of, for everyone, all of especially us need schizophrenics. To do that. I used to tell the kids that I would work with, you know, imagine that your mind has this happy balloon and you got to, you got to keep it up. You can't let it fall. It will naturally fall. Why is that? I don't know. I have no idea, but it's, it's true for anyone. And so you have to, you have to do things to love yourself so that you actually can keep that balloon in the air. Right. And that they have to, too. And, uh, you know, schizophrenics have to want to get rid of those voices. If if they don't, there's nothing you can really oh, do for I them. Oh, I could imagine. I you could know, imagine. Those drugs don't get rid of anything. They don't cure anything. You know, they don't, they don't, they, they're, 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 most of them are toxic. You know, and these guys and are. And killing uh, the brain, like you said earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Wild. They, the autopsy showed that they, the, their brains were shrunk up with long-term use. They were shrunken like walnuts. Of course, the psychiatric mafia went nuts. Oh, no, it's not. It's the schizophrenia. It's not our medicines. Is that <laughs> no. why they call them shrinks? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, it They're could literally be. shrinking the brain. Shrinking, they literally shrink your brain. Yeah. yeah. Um, somebody asked a question, if you don't mind. Um, it is, do those entities like music? They like that uh, nasty rock music, that acid rock. That's what they like. They they like the rap stuff where they're talking about killing people and murdering people and sexually assaulting people. They like that. Great you know? question, Duke. They they don't like uh, peaceful music. They they don't like uh, religious music. But they hate the um, what do they call them? The Gregorian chants, especially the French Gregorian Gregorian chants. They can't mm -hmm. stand that. That really torments. Just beautiful. Them. <laughs> yeah. They don't like they don't like what anything that God created that is beautiful. I guess. No, they don't like anything beautiful. They don't like you being happy. They want you miserable. They want your energy. They could care less about you about the person. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, you know Ouija boards are very dangerous. Hundred you know, percent agree. And meth, meth and Ouija boards. I've I've seen so many people go psychotic on meth and Ouija boards. You know, they're playing the Ouija thing and they're talking to this entity. They don't know what it is. Next thing they know, the voice appears in their mind. And now now they're gone. So that was a portal. Yeah. Math yep. is a portal. That is. What about tarot cards? I don't know about tarot cards. You never I never saw a, that? I, I only had one experience with them and it came true. <laughs> oh, wow. So uh, it was like, I don't know what to think about tarot cards. Yeah. You know, and then then you got stuff like the I Ching and and I don't know, but I you know, the Ouija boards for sure. And the channeling, you never know what you're going to what you're channeling. You know, so these people that are, are trying to channel, I mean, one of these days they're going to get stuck with something that they don't like. You know, because these things are around, they hit all of us. It's not just the schizophrenics. You know, every negative thought you have about yourself or anybody else comes from the dark side. Mm -hmm. you know. Well, and that's why I think um social media is both you know this it's bittersweet because it can be the most amazing place where you can meet amazing people who are interested in the same things or you know you find someone like you from across the the, the country or the world but then you can you can get to where you you get on and it's war 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 you know yeah, yeah. division well, race it, like all this stuff and it just brings you down brings you down brings you down well, I'll tell you, if you look at the, all these patterns that I, I have here, the 32 of them, you read them, they man, they, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between these negative patterns that the schizophrenic voices are running and what the mainstream media is, is broadcasting to us right now. It's mm. the same stuff on a macroscopic level. You yeah. know, the fear, the negativity, the anti-religion stuff, the, the fostering of negative emotion. You know, it's all draining negative stuff. It's the same it's the same entities in a, in a macroscopic larger. scale, a larger sure. scale, you know, so this is spiritual battle that we're facing right now on this planet and a huge one. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. And that's why, that's why I work really hard and I've learned to detach in really healthy ways so that I can, I can function and be one of the people that raises people up rather than brings people down. Um, also gifted with just a natural happy demeanor, 
which is mm -hmm. also lucky, <laughs> you know, yeah, it, it offends some people. It kind of like, you know, how you said that they don't like the, the Bible or whatever. Some people get aggravated with me, but it's just the way it is. Can't make everyone happy. Yeah, they don't, they don't want them to be happy. They don't want them to be content. They don't want them to succeed at anything. They'll sabotage them every chance they get. They, they warp their reality, their perception of reality. You know, and it, it's, it's like these things are energetic. You know, it's, it's like uh, uh, if you have a magnet, a strong magnet, you can't see that, that magnetic field. You can't see it. You can't smell it. You can't taste it for all practical purposes. It doesn't exist. You, you, you can't sense it with your senses. And that's why it's and, so hard for people to recognize because they're not conscious of how they feel. And they've been told, oh, don't pay attention to your emotions. Use your logic. And, yeah, right. and then you really get, you know, sideswiped because you, you don't even see it coming because you're not in tune. Yep. And, you know, what, what the psychiatric mafia does, it's, it's you, you see the magnetic field when you put a, a jar of iron pilings on it. Now, now you can see the field. Okay. The field for schizophrenia are these patterns. You know, and what they've done is they've taken them and they've kicked them up, first of all, to they've blamed it on mothers to start with. Oh, the mothers did something to cause these people to be schizophrenic. So when the, when they saw the mothers were like, hey, we didn't do anything. I mean, we're, we're victims of this, too. You know, so, you know, it's, it was something you could see. So they took it and they kicked it up into the genetic area. Oh, it's a genetic uh, uh, abnormality. And they got away with that for years going, oh, yeah, it's something wrong with the genes. Uh, just, the only thing you could do is take these toxic medicines for it. You know? And then some of the geneticists finally got around to looking at it. They couldn't find any genetic but schizophrenia gene. You know? so, so they knocked that out. So they had to keep something where, where people couldn't see the result themselves. You know, who's, who's going to – you need a geneticist to understand that stuff. So they kick it up in an area where the victims don't understand what's going on. So they said, well, this is the cause and there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. So then they took it when the geneticist said, hey, we well, don't find a schizophrenia gene. So then they start this biochemical imbalance nonsense, complete lie. And the universities are teaching it. You know, so here's all these psychologists and psychiatrists coming out brainwashed that mental illness is due to a biochemical imbalance. You know, yeah. the MACE method is showing that it's not, you know, that it, these things can be gotten rid of and they can be gotten rid of permanently. There's a way to do it. And uh, uh, it, it just goes on and on. They, they, it's just a big merry-go-round. They, they, they keep drugging these people. They go with their drugs. They put them in the hospital. They charge them 10,000 bucks or whatever for a week. Their mm -hmm. insurance runs out. They put them back on the drugs, kick them out again. And six months later, they're back again and they'll run the whole cycle. So it's like a giant money fleecing machine and mm -hmm. nobody's getting any better. Mm -hmm. You know, these drugs don't cure anything, nothing. Are you mostly working with schizophrenics or do you do everything, you know? Well, I, I do everything. And it's, okay. it's, schizophrenics are, are hard. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times... We don't completely get rid of the voices, but we get rid of the stuff that the voices feed off of. Right. So they're they're weakened. And then if the person is really serious about getting rid of them, we can give them things to do that will weaken them further. Right. You know, right. So they the food that they feed off of, because they you know they 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 can go into the the schizophrenic's mind and see every rotten thing they've ever done, because they're energetic. So. You know, treating them with drugs is like pouring Thorazine or Risperdal on a magnetic field. You know, these things are energetic. They're not physical. Physical drugs do, do not affect them. They affect the brain. They sure. sedate the person so they're like zombies. They're still hearing the voices, though. You know, they're just not as upset about it. Now, the Man. voices don't like those drugs because they don't want the person sedated. They want them upset so they can feed off them. <laughs> yeah. You know, so that's one of the reasons psychiatrists get attacked by schizophrenics at a higher rate than any other sure. doctor. Yeah. You know, they, they, you know, one they, of the benefits, they, I guess, of Zoom nowadays. I mean, I don't know. Do they do they meet on Zoom? I they didn't have Zoom at uh, when I was working. They they had a they had closed circuit television that they wanted us to 
cover yeah. different ERs with. They had that, right. but they, they didn't have Zoom. They, usually we were right there in the population. Oh, okay. You know, and the state hospital was like being in a sea of insanity, you know. But uh, I think one of the things that saved me is I was an adrenaline junkie. <laughs> you know, that helped a lot. Well, you get like a, like a, whoa, that was wild. You know, it's a crazy yeah. story. Um, So it's, you get a dopamine hit, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. It's nuts. Well, thank you so much for, for being here. Thanks for sharing with us. If people want to find Jerry's list of 32 now, you have added some more. Yeah. They um, can go to the jerrymarsinski.com under articles. Okay. And it'll be there. Also, also is a, the, the what's the what's title of the, the article? Uh, do you well, remember? it's I think I think it's some, something to do with patterns. Okay, um, I, I forgot what it was, but there's okay. another one there that would help schizophrenics that Sherry Sweeney came up with, and it's how she got rid of them, and it's called the That's a Lie program. Yes, because ninety eight percent of what they tell the patient are lies. And right. So if you res you respond back to them, that's a lie. Uh, they can't they can't get you they have to get you to believe what they're saying in order yeah. to get control of you yeah and if I you don't believe what they're saying they, they can't get you a hundred percent i worked with um byron katie who has written all kinds of books and she's nationally known and she's just a fascinating woman and she has a similar concept now it wasn't for schizophrenics it was just for basic self-help, but she doesn't say that's a lie. She says, is it true? And, and you ask yourself, is that really true? Cause a lot of times, you know, all of the stuff that we say about ourselves, it's just a thought that came in and, and why are we buying that? You know? Yeah. And you have to ask similar. yourself, where does that thought come from? You know, does that come from you? Are you leveling these thoughts against yourself? No, those thoughts are coming in from the outside, from the dark spot and you know, from the dark side. Yeah. Have you ever heard of um, Archaics? Mm -mm. Okay. So there's this guy on YouTube who I just discovered through somebody on Twitter. Um, he's He was he was an actual prisoner, but he was like this nerd prisoner. And apparently he ran the thing because he wanted to study. And he literally spent 27 years or whatever studying like all these crazy calendars. He went back in, you know, BC, all kinds of anything that he could find information on, all the oldest books he could find. He was, you know, trading this stuff around through the libraries and stuff. But he has this whole theory about this simulation and how we're kind of in this AI unknown mm -hmm. thing and, ha and that these things are being pushed at us uh, and that we can overcome it through one thing. And that is not being afraid. And it's wild yes. to me because that is biblical. That is absolutely biblical. Like what yeah. he is teaching in different words is, you know, God is everywhere. He is the field, but that Satan has power over the earth. And the, yep. he's the prince of the air, right? The airwaves. And um, and I, I just think you might find him interesting just because. Uh, well, the, yeah, that makes that makes perfect sense, because that's what these voices want the person to experience is fear. Yeah. 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 Now, anybody who wants to learn about how we came to these conclusions can get this book. It's yep. on Amazon. You can see it. Amazing journey into the psychotic mind. That's how we came to these uh the conclusions we have that these voices that schizophrenics are hearing are not hallucinations. And so Sherry was your co-author. Sherry, Sherry was my co-author. She heard voices when she was a young woman and they almost killed her, you know, so, you know, we worked together on this uh, and she, it was 10 years. I knew her before she told me she was hearing voices or she had heard voices and I couldn't believe it because she's one of the most spiritual people I know. And so I started whacking her with questions that only somebody who heard voices could yeah. answer. Yeah. And she was like, bam, 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 right, boom, boom. And then after a while, we went, well, we got to tell the world about this. I mean, they have to know. Right. So we decided to do this, you know, work together and, and put this information out. Because the psychiatric mafia and, and big pharma, they have, it's like. Such a stranglehold know, on people. Oh, shoot. Yeah. And they have lots of money. It's like David and Goliath. It's like, you know. Uh, Do you guys sell it on Amazon or just on your website? Yeah. No, it's okay. on Amazon and it's on the website. 
Okay, I'll please. find the link for for both, and I'll put that under in the description box as well. Thank well, you thank so you. much. And tell your wife thank you, too, for sharing you. <laughs> it was very nice of her <laughs> no on problem. Sunday night. <laughs> we appreciate it. Yeah, um, no thanks, problem. everybody. I hope you have a good Sunday night. What's left of it?